We're kicking uh, the summit off uh, with Mitch Goldberg, Dr. Mitch Goldberg, who's the chief scientist with the JPSS program. Uh, that's out of NOAA and uh, the NESDIS uh, group in NOAA. And so uh, I want to introduce you to what JPSS is about a little bit. So we'll roll this video, and then uh, Mitch will dive right into his presentation. We have a lot of eye candy from uh, Mitch here, so stand by. LC on that one, verifying all stations manned and systems ready. Mission name JPSS-1. Talker. Ready. Timer. Ready. QAM. Ready. FSC. Ready. Drop one. Ready. Copy, slow as possible. All console operators, telemetry monitors, and observers. The remainder of the countdown activities are hazardous. Status check. Proceed with terminal count. Report go, no go. Talker. Go. FSC. Go. Prop 1. Go. Prop 2. Go. PDA. Go. And liftoff of Delta 2 and NOAA's Joint Polar Satellite System 1, making the U.S. a more weather ready nation. introduction and the video too. Uh, so it took us three times to get that baby launched and finally it's up there and it's working great. So I'm going to show you some good images and products from JPSS. Um, I also, you know, this is a great time for us because every 20 years or so you get a new operational satellite series. And this is the year. This is the year for both GOES, geostationary, and polar satellites. And it just, it comes in a great time because we've been having all this extreme weather events and we really need this advanced technology, so it's, it's a perfect time. So I'm actually going to talk about both GOES-R and JPSS, uh, because both are critical uh, for forecasting and also environmental intelligence. I'm going to show a lot of examples of how we use this for environmental intelligence, not just weather forecasting. Um, so I'd like to thank the GOES-R and JPS teams for uh, providing a lot of this material. And so let's get started. So NOAA um, observational paradigm has always been really two orbits one mission, or two type of satellites, and one mission. And that mission is really the, the weather forecast mission. And pl plus, it has grown over time to the environmental monitoring uh, mission. We provide data to not just weather service, but to fisheries and, and ocean services, and also for climate as well. So here's our polar satellite system. It's been operating since, operationally since the 1970s. It provides us with global observations. It's a critical data that goes into forecasts, so we try to provide good forecasts now out to seven days. Back in 1970, it was probably out to two days. You know, we've really advanced weather forecasting quite a bit. And then, of course, the geostationary is the sentinel of the sky, right? It's the satellite that's always observing weather um, as it's unfolding. So they're both are critical. So you want to be able to predict weather, extreme weather out to seven days so you can prepare. And at the same time, was and when weather's happening, you have to watch it as it unfolds for uh, very short-term near casting or now casting opportunities. So, and this approach has uh, produced great returns over the years. Uh, we made this is a chart which I'll talk about more later in the presentation, but it basically shows skill anomaly correlations for the three. Um, let's see, the three to five to seven to 10 day forecast as a function of time. And so if you get an anomaly correlation of 100%, that's perfect. This is at 500 millibars, uh, about 18,000 feet. 
basically is the storing, you know, the, the, the level where storms, the steering current uh, resides. So it's very important for predicting storm storms. And basically you see that there's been significant improvement over time. That's a combination of things going on. So one is the Sally data going into it, one is the model improvements, and one is the, uh, more supercomputers. So this approach of using both, um, both uh, geostationary and polar satellites has greatly improved the forecast over time. It's also very important for now casting for se severe storm uh, warnings, so near casting. And also, it's also used for search and rescue. You probably don't know too much about this, but when there's a distress signal, it actually goes back, goes to our weather satellites and then speed down, and also data collection services as well. So let's talk first about GOZAR. So GOZAR um, was launched in um, November 2016. Big improvement over uh, earlier series, three times the number of channels, four times the better spatial resolution, and five times faster scans. GO16 is now operational um, from de December 18, 2017. It's at 75.2 degrees west. And this is the first sunrise seen by the new operational GOES East um, um, you know, uh, satellite. And you can see that the refresh, you can see that you're monitoring weather in real time. The disk, the full disk imagery, the refresh has increased considerably. Full disk about every 15 minutes. The old generation only every three hours. Over um, CONUS, over the US, it's as fast as every 30 seconds. Anomaly, it's every five minutes. So it's pretty amazing that we can track these storms in real time. And we also have the very first lightning mapper imager. And so we can see lightning during the day, during the night. So that's incredible. So we'll be able to see the cloud systems, uh, severe weather, plus the lightning all together. And this is a combination of the ABI, which is the imager, uh, infrared, um, basically color-coded. So these are the cold cloud tops here where you see these darker colors uh, associated with the lightning flashes. So you'll be able to uh, use this data for your uh, broadcasts. Very good real-time data. This is the solar eclipse. We're going to have a talk later, uh, I think tomorrow, on the solar eclipse. And so this is the solar eclipse as observed by geostationary. And it's amazing because if you look closer and in this area, you'll see, for example, the suppression, uh, suppression of cumulus. And then right after, it just pops up again. So it's, it's very nice imagery here. Yeah. This is a combination. The, you know, we have so many spectral bands. We can do neat stuff. It's not just black and white. There's a lot of true color enhancements, a lot of RGB. And this is a, a product that takes the VIRS, I mean the VIRS, I'll talk about VIRS later, takes the visible from geostationary with the infrared from geostationary, blends it together so you can see better texture. You can see more texture in the clouds by using the combination. Also, you, the colder temperatures are associated with the high clouds. If, if this was just visible, you wouldn't really know about the height of the clouds. So the infrared tells you about the height of the clouds because of colder temperatures. So you, that's a good example. Uh, we also see the sun. So this is a clip of a, you looking at huge solar flares. That's very important for space weather. And we'll hear more about space weather also um, um, tomorrow. And this is uh, Hurricane Maria. Um, so beautiful imagery. Um, and so it really gives the public a sense of, uh, of that they have to prepare for these events while watching these systems unfold. And this is when it hits uh, Puerto Rico later. Uh, in the JPS thus part of the talk, I'll show uh, how VIRS is able to show the, the power outages by using the day-night band. And the California fires, so you, we can watch fires in real time. And this is very interesting. Um, so, so with SUMI NPP um, and JPSS, we have an imager with much higher spatial resolution, 375 meters. This has two kilometer resolution. So you really want to use both in tandem, because there'll be situations where fire will be small and will stay small for a long time. So for example, the Chekhov fire, um, I think in Oregon, um, that wasn't detected by geostationary until three days, three days after it was detected by, by JPSS, by SUMI MPP, because the fire was so small. Um, occasionally, a lot of times, you'll have these fires that just will start up really fast. 
So that's where the geostationary comes in. So you really want to use both data sets. You want to be able to detect really small fires, especially if they're um, you know, slow grow growing fires, so you can determine if you want to react to those fires, right? You, you have a small fires, looking at the conditions, weather forecasts. Let's say it's going to continue dry, winds are going to pick up. You're going to want to detect those small fires early so that you can put them out, right? So you can do something about it. Now, the Tubbs fire um, in the Napa Valley, that took off. And, and geostationary was the first to be able to detect that fire. So, uh, so this fire um, was the most destructive wildfire in California history, burning parts of Napa, Sonoma, and Lake Counties in Northern California during October 2017. By the time it was over, um, it burned nearly 37,000 acres, killed 22 pe at least 22 people. Uh, more than 2,800 buildings were destroyed, and, um, and the fire alert of the fire at the Bay Area Weather Service came from the GO-16 ABI product, which was, de was detected at 947 Pacific Daylight Time. It was rapid uh, intensification. So this is an example of a movie loop that shows how quickly that fire grew. So that fire was, that grew in minutes. And, and if we walk through the next number of slides, you can see as a function of time, 9.37, nothing there, right? Nothing. Oh, this is band 7, which is sensitive to fires, uh, 3.9 micron channel. This is the fire product down here. So this basically says that there's fire or not. This is a, you know, the end result of an algorithm. And so there's nothing in 9.37. 9.42, a little bit of a signal here, but the algorithm didn't pick anything up. And then 947, you, you get your first fire detection. And that's at a two kilometer resolution, so that's pretty massive. And then it continues. So within 20 minutes of the first being detected, the fire really grew. Saturated the, uh, these are saturated pixels, which means it was so intense that it saturated the pixel. So this was a great example of how geostationary picked up that fire really fast. Uh, we great. You know, we have great imagery. Um, this is uh, stratus cumulus at every, uh, I guess, 15, I think 15 or five minutes. I can't tell. But this is really high resolution imagery. And one day, when numerica, this will be the truth, the validation data set that goes into future uh, weather forecast models, where we'll be able to forecast this, be able to show this. And so the geostationary is going to be critical for helping improve models, because it will show basically the dynamics. So that's really good. And this is the uh, snow lake, uh, Great Lake Effects snows. And so you can see how that uh, manifests over time. So that's a nice image too, or animation. And then this is the, the blizzard, the bomb cyclone as it's called. Now, the background are city lights that are static lights. Geostationary doesn't have a uh, a a day-night band channel that can see city lights. So this is from Veers. We use it as a backdrop. And then this is so you can see where you are during the night. And, uh, and this is the progress over time. So it's beautiful imagery. All right. OK, one of the critical, uh, I'm going to say later that, you know, that, um, that polar satellites are really critical for weather forecasting. And it's a true statement. <laughs> <laughs> but also what's very critical is also the geostationary winds. They're very critical. And later on, I'll show you, so you, show you like a scorecard that basically shows you know, which, um, you know, which uh, observation type uh, reduces forecast error as a function of the different observation type. So with, um, with geostationary, we have higher temporal resolution. So you get more winds or more refreshing winds. We, have, we can monitor. Uh, Clouds. So we're, what, basically what we're doing, we're watching the clouds move, and we're tracking them, and we're doing feature uh, detection, uh, and we're computing the speed of the wind from the clouds on this side. Now, on this side, on the left, that's water vapor winds. Every now and then, you don't have clouds, but you always have water vapor, so you can track water vapor. That's why water vapor winds are important. So you can look at this area here, for example. And there's not that many cloud reports or wind reports coming out because there aren't any clouds. But you get a lot of uh, reports from the water vapor. 
So that's really important, and that's a critical data set for weather forecasting. And so here's a uh, list of products. And, um, and next, you know, now we're getting ready for Goes S, which will be on Goes uh, West. The launch is on March 1st. I have a little video next that, sh that sh shows getting ready for uh, Goes S. I don't hear the sound. Oh. T minus 30 seconds and counting. Status check. Go Alice. Go Centaur. Go Goes R. Three, two, one. Liftoff of Noah's Goes R, America's most advanced weather eye in the sky, elevating environmental intelligence to new heights and saving lives. Since Go 16 launched, it has helped the United States forecast and prepare for major weather events, like the severe 2017 hurricane season. Go 16 is now operational as Noah's Goes East satellite technology on board the satellite has provided three times more imaging channels with four times greater resolution, five times faster than ever before. This means better and more accurate data for the National Weather Service and local officials. This year, NOAA will launch GOES 16's sister satellite, GOES S, which will be called GOES 17 when it reaches its geostationary orbit and will take the GOES West position once operational. As an equal partner in the sky, GOES-S will be able to provide critical data for the westernmost United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. GOES-S will expand coverage of the advanced baseline imager technology beyond the Pacific Ocean, allowing meteorologists and rescue officials to see severe weather events and developing hazards like floods and wildfires in near real time. Thanks to GOES-S, emergency managers will be equipped with more accurate weather predictions and faster warnings, providing a real impact, saving lives, and protecting infrastructure. GOES-S is scheduled to launch aboard an Atlas V 541 rocket from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida in March of this year. Like GOES-16, GOES-S carries a suite of sophisticated Earth sensing, lightning detecting, solar imaging, and space weather monitoring instruments. The advanced technology on board GOES-S will provide critical data and imagery in near real time. Watching over Earth from 22,300 miles above, GOES-S will help bring vital data to our weather-ready nation. Again, the launch is on March 1st this year, coming up soon. And here's um, our commitment. So where we say uh, at NESIS, we have our strategic plan, um, the three Cs, uh, commitment. So what does that mean? We're committing to these advanced observations for the next 20 years and more, right? So that's the base of the timeline of GO16, GOES S, T, and U. So we go out for seven, uh, so many years. and. Uh, we also uh, work with the community too, and we have this capability. So we have uh, commitment, capability, and community. Capability is fielding systems that will deliver the data, and working the community is basically, um, you know, improving applications, right? Improving forecasts, things like that. All right. Now we're gonna, and here's you can get more information that goes off on these um, things. So now we're gonna turn to JPSS Polar Satellites. What can polar satellites do for you? Polar satellites you don't really see on TV, right? You don't really see it on forecast uh, because it's not moving, it's not animating. But beautiful, stunning imagery. And sometimes you, just a snapshot um, is a significant message. So I'll show you some of that. So, oh, so anyway, I'm gonna start with this movie and uh, give you a background on, on JPSS and then get into the details. The Joint Polar Satellite System is the nation's next generation of polar orbiting environmental satellites. JPSS represents significant technological and scientific advancement in severe weather prediction and environmental monitoring. JPSS satellites circle the Earth from pole to pole and cross the equator 14 times daily in the afternoon orbit, providing full global coverage twice a day. In fact, polar satellite data is considered the backbone of the weather forecast. 
JPSS satellite simultaneously provides sophisticated meteorological data and observations of atmosphere, ocean, and land for short-term seasonal and long-term monitoring and forecasting. JPSS data increases the timeliness and accuracy of forecast three to seven days in advance of severe weather events. NOAA's National Weather Service uses JPSS data as a critical input for numerical forecast models, providing the basis for essential mid-range forecasts. These forecasts allow for early warnings and enable emergency managers to make timely decisions to protect American lives and property, including ordering effective evacuations. JPSS satellites also provide critical observations in polar regions. In Alaska, JPSS supports essential forecasting for economically vital aviation, maritime, oil, and gas industries. JPSS also enables scientists and forecasters to monitor and predict weather patterns with greater accuracy and to study long-term climate trends by extending the more than 30-year satellite data record. Satellites in the JPSS constellation host state-of-the-art instruments. They are the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder, Cross-Track Infrared Sounder, Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, Ozone Mapping and Profiler Suite, and an instrument to measure the Earth's radiation budget. Together, these instruments gather global measurements of atmospheric, terrestrial, and oceanic conditions, including atmospheric temperature and moisture, hurricane intensity, clouds, rainfall, dense fog, volcanic ash, fire location and smoke plumes, sea and land surface temperatures, vegetation, snow and ice cover, and ozone. Information from JPSS satellites supports every area of NOAA's mission, including ensuring a more weather-ready nation, healthy coasts, resilient coastal communities, and adapting and mitigating climate change. Okay, and here's our flyout chart, uh, basically showing that we're making a commitment now to, again, 2030 and beyond. So both geostationary and polar satellites, we, right now we have the most advanced technology on these satellites, and we'll have them for, uh, oh, many, many years, next 20, 20 years. So that's, that's good. And so uh, we launched um, JPS-1, which is now called NOAA 20, and it's 50 minutes ahead of SUMI and PP. So again, it's in uh, low Earth orbit, the Earth is moving under, uh, you know, the satellite. Unlike, you know, geostationary, which is at 22,300 miles, and it's moving at the same speed as the Earth is move, uh, moving, so that's why it's always overhead. And so uh, we get 14 orbits per day. Uh, we'll have two now, NOAA 20 and SUMI MPP, and it provides 85% of the data. Uh, all polar satellites, polar satellites together provide about 85% of the data that goes into numerical weather prediction. So uh, JPS provides critical data for NWP, uh, you know, helping them to um, forecast out to three to seven days. It's a combination of the models, the, the data going into it. I'll, I'll talk more about that. Because of its uh, polar orbit and overlapping the poles, it's, it's critical for Alaska. It provides high spatial resolution over Alaska. Uh, uh, and that's important for their operational forecasting. So sort of near the poles um, or in Alaska, especially northern Alaska, it's like the geostationary satellite because you're getting a lot of overlap. You're getting 14 orbits per day per satellite, so a lot of overlap. And we also have unique capabilities. Uh, uh, we have a day-night band that allows us to um, do visible imagery at night using uh, moonlight. And also without moonlight, you can see lights, you can see uh, city lights, you can see um, lava flows within volcanoes, you can s s detect, detect a lot of things. So here are our instruments. So we have a lineup of really advanced instruments. So, so when we say that JPSS is critical for um, weather forecasting, what do we really mean? Why is that? Uh, because it's unique in a sense, and also polar satellites in general is unique, uh, that they have something called infrared and microwave sounders. ATMS is a microwave sounder. It sees the atmosphere. It measures temperature and water vapor throughout the entire atmosphere. Uh, and that's critical for forecasting. You need to know the state of the atmosphere, not just at the surface, not at the top of clouds, but 
but throughout the atmosphere. And so microwave, uh, because the wavelength is small compared to, um, the, I mean large compared to the size of the particles, um, like clouds, it can see through clouds. Infrared, on the other hand, um, it's contaminated by clouds. It can't see through clouds, but it has higher spectral resolution, uh, which gives you higher vertical resolution in, in information. So if you look at a feature of a temperature profile, a water vapor profile, from the infrared sounder, you'll see more details than you would see from the microwave sounder. But the microwave sounder sees through clouds, infrared um, can't penetrate clouds, but we actually use them together. So that's why on all our satellite systems, we always have a microwave infrared sounder. Uh, microwave is also contaminated by larger droplets. So if you have heavy rain, rain droplets, you can do rain measurements. Um, it's, it's detected by scattering due to an emissivity due to snow and ice. So you can ma map ice and snow with the microwave. Uh, CRIS, uh, which is again the infrared hyperspectral, can also do trace gases. It can see CO from forest fires. It can measure CO2, it can measure SO2 plumes, a lot of capability. Now VIRS is our um, visible infrared imaging radiometer suite. That is our, uh, basically our environmental work workhorse. That has 22 bands, high spatial resolution, 375 meters, has a 3,000 kilometer swath. It does a lot of um, imaging and also environmental intelligence, for example, fog, smoke plumes, um, the health of vegetation, uh, ocean color. Um, it's very important for uh, land and ocean ecosystems. Um, and I'll show some more examples later. And then we have OMPS. That's critical for observing ozone, global ozone. Important for looking at the recovery of stratospheric ozone. Um, and also, it's used as input into models for UV indices. Um, and it's also used for um, air quality applications. And then the last on our lineup is uh, Ceres, which is for Earth radiation budget uh, experiments or, or analysis. So we have a really good lineup. And we generally have a lot of good instrumentation on polar satellites because it's in a lower orbit. It's more achievable to do so. And so, we, and so the polar satellites, again, provides a critical data for NWP. So here's an image of or comparisons of how did we improve, how did we actually improve our satellites from the last generation? Well, one thing, this is the microwave, the AMPSU. AMPSU has been flying a NOAA satellite since 1998. We still have NOAA 15 operating today, and that was launched in 1998. So this year will be its 20th anniversary. And so AMPSU, what we want to do we want to improve ATMS over AMPSU by providing higher spatial resolution. We want to remove these so-called orbital gaps. These are gaps between the different orbits. Remember, there's 14 orbits per day. So you can see we have higher spatial resolution, oversampling from ATMS, and we got rid of a lot of the gaps. There's a little gap here. Um, now, with uh, NOAA 20 flying in sequence with SUMI MVP, Anytime you have a gap, that's going to be covered, painted over by NOAA 20. So that's really cool. I'll show some examples of that. So that's a big improvement. All right. Now, Chris has 2,200 channels, 2,211 channels. So I can't show every channel. We'll be here all day. Uh, and, we want to, and we don't want to be here all day. Uh, but in terms, it has all these channels because it, it has to improve the vertical uh, resolution. Um, the HERS instrument, which was on the the NOAA sat polar satellite since 1978 um, has very poor vertical resolution, which means that if you look at the temperature and moisture profiles from that um, instrument, HERS, it's very broad. It's, it has no detail at all. And CRIS provides six times uh, more vertical resolving power. So that's a, that's a big improvement. And then we have OMPS, um, OMPS uh, Global Ozone. Uh, in the past, we didn't get global ozone. We only had near nadir observations. This is from SVUV. And now we have these global observations. So that's, that's a big improvement. And then for our VIRS, um, uh, when you compare VIRS with MODIS, MODIS is our NASA satellite. We have a much larger swath. We have much, have high, much higher spatial resolution, even at the edge. This compares the edge of MODIS compared to the edge of VIRS. Uh, much higher spatial resolution. You can observe the entire polar region, Antarctic, and, and with two orbits. Uh, big improvement over AV, AVHR, which has flown on NOAA satellites since 19, late 1970s. And this is what global coverage looks like from VIRS.
Uh, excellent coverage in the polar regions. So this uh, basically shows ice monitoring at night, first time ever. Um, that's using the day-night band. So I'm looking at ice. Uh, the ice is being reflected by moonlight. And then this is, remember um, when I showed you the geostationary of the winds uh, from geostationary? This is the winds in the polar region. So together, the polar winds are used along with the geo winds to give us a global coverage of winds at various levels in the atmosphere, layers of the atmosphere. And these are our data products. So we also have a long list of data products. Now, these data products are very useful, but they're more useful when we actually improve applications. So within JPS and both Gozar, we have these activities. Um, you can call them user readiness uh, activities or application. Um, we call it actually proving ground and risk reduction. But it's really the, the, the purpose of, these, the, of this next step is to take these products, both from JPS, that's and Gozar, and actually do something with them, improve application services. So within NOAA, we have this great network of systems, observation, which are shown here. And within these systems are our satellites feeding into all these services. So we have a very active program trying to um, basically improve these services. So for example, uh, we're working to provide better flood warnings using our imager data, um, improving hurricane forecasting. On this side is um, ecosystems, habitat assessments, things like that. So we've been working with these services within NOAA and also outside of NOAA as well. Um, engaging them to improve the services that they provide today. And then, of course, these services go to the stakeholders, so you guys are stakeholders as well. And it goes to, uh, you know, government stakeholders and also uh, local, state, government, and, and private stakeholders, private companies. All right. And so these are the things that we've been focusing on improving applications. I'll show you some examples. So we have a Fire and Smoke Initiative, trying to improve the detection of fires as well as predicting its smoke. We have a River Ice and Flooding Initiative down here, for example, improving ice detection on rivers and also floods. And this has been a very active year, very active year. We had a lot of flooding in, um, from Harvey and Irma, and I'll show you some examples of that. And we had a lot of fire and smoke. I'll show you some examples So, uh, just from this past year. So what we try to do is we work with the user community we talk about our capabilities. This is what we can do. They tell us about our needs, their needs. Like, what, well, this is what we do. You know, I think this can help us. And we have a great dialogue. And we have these teams. We call them um, initiative teams, about 20, 30 people, focusing on a clear objective. And it's been very successful. Uh, so, so JPSS, uh, I want to underscore that the primary role of JPSS is really it's, a core, it's really a core component of the weather forecast enterprise. Uh, I already mentioned 85% of all data in, that is used in forecast models are from polar orbiting satellites. And if you look at what observation types contribute to reducing forecast error, and people do these studies all the time. Um, this is from ECMWF. And they're showing that 60% of the type of observations needed or that's actually reduced the forecast error comes from microwave and infrared sounders. So those are the instruments on JPSS. This is just a, you know, you know, Bill LaPenta will show something like this later in his talk, but basically shows the confidence of the weather forecast models. I mean, we've been very fortunate to have very accurate forecasts. And, and we play, the satellite community, community plays its role by providing the critical data um, into the models. Uh, but there's a lot more that goes into that. It's a combination of things. Um, this is a, um, the observation types contributing to uh, reducing forecast errors. So a lot of these names, uh, acronyms, you're probably very unfamiliar with. But basically, when you look at the list, and this is from GFS, this is from MENSA. The other chart was from ECMWF. So the number one observation type that reduces forecast error the most is polar satellites. This is actually from MEDOP, uh, the European Satellite System. EASI. Um, this is a hyperspectral infrared sounder. There's two of them. So when you look at these charts, you have to say, wait a minute, why is EASI so large compared to anything else? Because there's actually two EASIs, two satellites going into that. AMPSU-A, which is the microwave sounder, that's on the legacy pose. Uh, there's actually five of them. So that has a big score here. 
Then number three on the lineup are the satellite winds. Those are the winds that I showed earlier, the geostationary winds. That's critical. And then the weather balloons. That's critical too. You still need the weather balloons. And then we have the Chris instrument, uh, which remember we only have one Chris, so you can't compare one Chris with two Aussies, but they're all competitive. Then aircraft data, then these other hyperspectral, and then these other observations. Uh, and ATMS is down here, because remember only one ATMS compared to five answers. And, and then finally, you can see the geostationary goes here. Now, the GOES is providing these winds, and this is all the geostationary. So we have a, you know, a global constellation. So we're using geostationary data from Europe, from Japan, um, and so on. And, um, and so it's a global constellation of geostationary winds. The GOES, so when we look at geostationary, and this is actually the current GOES, I mean the past GOES, not GOES 16, because they haven't put that into the system yet. Um, but so GOES has a low ranking because it's, um, it's starved, uh, it doesn't have that vertical dimension. If you look at the observation types up here, what's, what do they have in common? They're telling you something about the atmosphere, the, the vertical dimension of the atmosphere. The geostationary is showing the, image, the clouds, image, imagery. That's really important for now casting, right? You have to see where the clouds are moving. Line of thunderstorms are coming through, you need to see it. So that's important for watching weather unfolds. But the impact is small when it comes to the um, you know, forecasting out to three to seven days. And then our old, remember, remember I said um, Chris has six times the vertical resolution resolving power than uh, something called HERS? Well, this is HERS. This is from the POSE satellite, the old operational satellite. And you can see how small that's not even, that doesn't register anything. And so you can see well, how vertical resolution matters. Uh, vertical resolution, resolving the atmosphere is critical. So you can compare hers here, oh, can't find the cursor, to a Chris here. So basically both are infrared sounders, but both one has high vertical resolution, the other one has coarse resolution. And so you can see the impact it has on NWP. All right, this is an example of why polar satellite data is critical, why these type of observations listed on top are critical. Uh, ECMWF did a study that showed Hurricane Sandy. I think a lot of you have seen this already. With and without polar satellite data, and so this is with. The five-day forecast, this is without. So you don't want to have no polar satellite data going to this model. You would never want this, uh, this forecast because you wouldn't even start any, any preparations until much later. Eventually, the observations catch up. So the two-day forecast, even without polar satellite data, would, would still have a good forecast. But is two days enough to prepare for extreme weather event? You saw how um, having a good five-day forecast from Irma got Florida ready, FEMA, state and local governments. So forecasting is really, really important out to seven days. So I wanted to show this uh, because this is your business. So I think, so again, this is a three, five, seven-day, 10-day forecast. The, what you're looking at and I think what I want to describe is how this all came together, all right? So what you're looking at is the northern hemisphere skill score, or anomaly correlation, and the southern hemisphere. So that's the difference between these two. Three-day forecast, five-day forecast, seven-day forecast, 10-day forecast. And notice they all come together about this time period. Now, the, during this time period, and this is anomaly correlation, again, 500 millibars is critical steering flow level. So that's why people like to look at 500 millivolts. Now, if you look at this area, you say, well, why is there a big difference between here, uh, between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere? Well, northern hemisphere has a lot of weather balloons, right? Remember I showed the list, weather balloons rank up there. Southern hemisphere is mostly ocean, there aren't weather balloons. So you get this big discrepancy, disparity. Uh, you get this big difference between the two. Now, in our earlier, even though we had an operational series here, it had that HERS instrument, which I said had no impact at all on forecast. So that's not going to help that so much. And we actually had an old microwave sounder, which had a 100 kilometer footprint and, um, and only a few channels. It wasn't until 1998, and then of course it takes a couple years to get use the data properly, that we started to have our first real good microwave sounder, the AMSU. All right. Now at the same time, something else is happening. 
during this time period. All right, the models improved quite a bit. 210 kilometers. Do you know what I'm looking at here? Does anyone know what this is? A 200 kilometer? You can't even know what that is. Okay, next is 63 kilometers. Any guesses what this is? Picture? No, it's going to be of Howard Bernstein. No. Uh, next one. Ah, maybe someone should be able to see something. Ah, yes. Jennifer wins. And then 16 kilometers. And now the model's even running uh, 8 to 10 kilometers. And that's ECMWF. NCEP is also in this range, too. So you can see the resolution. So a couple things happening. Uh, resolution of the model's improving. More computer power allows us to do this. And at the same time, these observations are improving. I don't have a fancy figure for this. I should. I'll have to work on that. But we started with the AMSUs, the, that microwave sounder with legs. We had the very first hyperspectral infrared sounder from NASA, AIRS. We had IAZI, which I showed you on that chart. AIRS was also on that chart. Uh, another hyperspectral sounder, uh, IAZI, on UMETSAT satellites. And, that's, uh, and there's two of them now. And then finally, um, Chris and ATMS launched in SUMI NPP in 2011, and another one up here from NOAA 20 in two, 2017. So all came together. And so in terms of weather forecasting, probably in the 1980s, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, or like, did you issue a five-day forecast in the 1980s? Like for forecasters? Any old, oh, Jim. <laughs> did you? Five-day forecast. Okay, so if you look at the five-day forecast in the 1980s, a little bit, uh, you know, it's not so bad, 70% uh, probability. Um, yeah, and so then in the, but not a seven-day forecast. When did you start issuing seven-day forecasts? Uh, the end of night, uh, I started uh, with a seven-day forecast. Uh, actually, as we went into the new millennium, Okay. 2000, New and, Year's Eve. And that looks good. So you're over 60%. So in 2000, you had like a 60% correlation. Uh, and then, now today though, look how good it is. It's 80%. And the five day is 90%. So you can see that we've extended the three day forecast out to five, the five out to seven. And the 10 day forecast has good work, but um, needs more work, of mm -hmm. course. but you know, we're getting to 50%. So question, anyway. Question. Yes. Um, this is for the European model. Is the American model very similar? Yeah, to very that? similar. Okay. Yeah, I would say, right? Very similar. Yeah. European models, they update this on a monthly basis. So it's easy to go to a website and copy it. But it's the same message. Our forecasts have improved significantly. And again, it's a. You should compare that to my seven day forecast and you feel even better about yourself. All right. <laughs> I, I, I want to. Okay. I'll have to take a look at that. So anyway, so anyway, it all came together. So I think uh, you know, we all have things to be proud of, and this is really, this all came together. I mean, the, the, we, we say that, the, and, and I know Bill is going to say more about this, but in terms of economic impact and importance, that five to seven day forecast is powerful. Being able to, so, so that's what we say. We, like the, we say the pole satellites are critical to really preparing for weather Preparing for good weather, too. If you're a construction company, you want to know when to build. You want a nice sunny day. I remember last year I was sitting outside at a, at a, in College Park. It was a beautiful 75-degree day, 75 degree day in February. I said, this is a powerful. It's not raining, but you can do outdoor construction for a few days. So anyway, it has a big economic impact. Um, so now the thing about polar satellites, though, is that it's, um, you know, only one doesn't cut it. So a polar satellite, if you have one, you only see the Earth twice per day near the equator. So that's why we have in JPSS, we have two. You know, uh, actually, SUMI NPP is our backup. So, you know, but, so, so, but we fly two to make sure we always have at least one. Um, the Europeans, they have also their satellites. And then you have this constellation. So this constellation is showing um, the, our satellites plus international community. And so, we use polar, so, so geostationary satellites, they can get away with only one satellite because it's observing our part of the world. Geostationary, I mean polar satellites, because you want better temporal cover, coverage, you need to use more of them. 
And so this is a nice comparison or a movie that basically shows how using um, NOAA 15, 18, 19, MetUp A and B, and SUMI MPP and Aqua, this could be updated with uh, you know, more satellites now. But when you look at this coverage, you can see that it's not twice per day. It's like you know, every couple of hours. And so that's why a constellation is really important. Um, and so you can do things with that. Um, so um, now this is. Um, uh, I have a real yeah, quick question, uh, yeah. Joe Murga from no, WTHA. Sure. Uh, do you think on that past slide, do you think we're going to get to the point? I mean, is it possible to ever get even more coverage, full coverage from the polar orbiters at almost an hourly rate? Well, no, it takes a, uh, yeah, I think in the future we're looking at, um, at you know, these systems are, are rather expensive. So we're looking at ways to improve temporal coverage by using CubeSats, for example, as a complementary measurement. Right now we do have uh, um, the Europeans, we have uh, us, the Chinese are coming on board. Uh, in the future, there's going to be very capable um, Chinese meteorological And they're good at sharing? Oh, they're good at sharing. It's the problem is, uh, you know, you know um, we have to verify the quality first. So we're going to do some experiments uh, with our university partners to assess the quality of this data. So, so when it comes to European satellites, as well as NOAA satellites, we have a long history of very accurate, stable measurements. So the new kids on the block, they, they're going to have to work out some kinks. You know, a lot of times their instruments will only last for a year or two. They have manufactured, well, it gets this new technology for them. For us, uh, we have a very good industrial base in the US where we have accurate instruments. Like, for example, ABI, which is on GOES, uh, you know, Korea and Japan, they buy ABI from um, Harris Corporation because our instruments are very good. It's better for them to buy our instruments than to build their own. So it's a combination. Now, every hour it's going to be tough. Every uh, two to three hours, it's, it's achievable. But uh, we'll have to see. But right now, we are living in the golden age because, um, because we do have these old satellites that are still running. So we have NOAA 15, for example, morning satellites. These old satellites also drift, and in, in, they drift during the day. So NOAA 18, which was an early afternoon satellite, is now a late evening satellite or, or late afternoon. So they drift. The new satellites don't drift because they have to have, we have things called uh, space debris policy. We have to have enough, we have to have stable orbits. We have to be able to deorbit over time. So this is pretty good, and I'm not going to say if it's going to get better. <laughs> Potentially it can, but, uh, but right now this is pretty good. And actually we've done studies that um, what we want to do with this is fuse the data with forecast models. So the forecast is pretty accurate. So one of the, uh, one of the key products that's coming out of this is this total precipitable water product. So this is seen looking at microwave water vapor. So one thing that you don't see you don't see those pesky clouds. They don't get in your way. So this is water vapor. And this is fusing, um, let's say, one, two, three, four, five satellites. Um, and it's doing a pretty good job. It's taking, what it's doing, it's taking, you can imagine if you had one orbit of, uh, of, of polar satellite data, let's say TPW, and it's taking the forecast and it's stretching it or, or, or constricting it based on the flow of the forecast. And it's doing that type of thing. And actually, we did experiments uh, uh, with, if, if we only had two satellites, what would happen? And it looked pretty good. So even with, I mean, they can't be two satellites in the same orbit. It has to be separated. So having a, a mid-morning orbit, 9.30, with your, your, your METSAT and us will actually be able to produce this product quite well. So, and your METSAT also has this commitment. They kind of have a new generation of satellites. They're also going out to 2040. So having a mid-morning orbit by the Europeans, uh, and an early morning orbit by the U.S. NOAA. Well, I think we're in good shape. What's the future for imaging? Uh, identify I have to identify myself. Yeah. No. <laughs> Greg Setzer <coughs> from CBS Miami. What's the future, if there is any, of a QuickSat type of satellite with ocean wind surface re surface wind retrieval? I think the DoD is looking at that early morning. We don't have um, ASCAT 
and um, which is on the Europeans, that will continue. They're going to have even a more advanced uh, scannerometer. So I think the DOD is looking at that. Okay, so this is neat, right? This is total precipitate water. You can see, uh, you know, these plumes of water vapor. Um, where you get really these high values, that really means it's heavy precip in here. And so you can look at these. A lot of times you have these plumes that will just go right across the Pacific and hit the U.S. Uh, Hawaiian Express, Pineapple Express, not Hawaiian Express. And then you can also see these, if I zoom in, you can see, uh, I think this is Maria. So this is what TBW looks like. And so it really shows, um, you know, how far the moisture is coming in, these conveyor belts of moisture. So it's a very powerful tool that forecasters use. And here's an example. So this is a multi-layer moisture field. So that was total precipitable water. This is looking at water vapor at different la layers in the atmosphere. So we have the surface to 850, 850 to 700, 700 to 500, 500 to 300 millibars. And we got really great feedback uh, uh, for like even this lake e effect snowstorm back in 2016. Or uh, it said the LPW, the layer precipitable water, shines again uh, as the 700 to 500 millibar panels show a lengthening, lengthening of moisture inflow. So that's what they like to look at. They want to see how far the fetch is. And that's hard to sometimes look at with geostationary because you have these winds. So it's a combination of these different measurements. So that has been a big success in getting feedback from the forecast. So this is an example how so-called static polar satellites, when you use a constellation and you merge, fuse it with a forecast, can get you really good um, uh, information. Now I'm going to talk, show some NOAA 20 examples. So NOAA 20. The data looks great from NOAA 20. This is the type of data. These are ATMS um, channels 2, 6, and 17. We have 22 channels. And this shows an example of the raw data. This raw data, these, these are called uh, temperature data records. Um, but they're instrument level data. They're assimilated directly into the model. So in the, our, the forecast models, they use that data. The forecast uses a, uh, a model, uh, a forward operator that knows how to use this data. We also have algorithms, you know, science algorithms that transforms this data into products. So this is an example of like uh, channel uh, 31 gigahertz will show you cloud liquid water. Uh, this one shows you uh, mid-level temperature. And this one shows you uh, more about moisture. And so you can see these blue dots, blue areas here is heavy precipitation areas. And we transform this data into products. So this is a 500 millibar temperature from ATMS. This is total precipitable water. And this is rain rates. So this is what we uh, transform the instrument input into things, geophysical parameters that people can use. OK, here's our first NOAA 20 VIRS image of the fires. Uh, and so you can see clearly the smoke coming out of it coming out of these fires uh, areas. Uh, this is a, another eye candy of the blue marble that NASA produced, NOAA 20. And also a lot more data for NOAA 20. This is our day-night band. So our day-night band has been a big hit. It's been used for monitoring um, power outages. It's been used for looking at ice. It's been used in rescues. There was a ship I think I talked to you about last year. A ship was stuck in the Bering Sea and it, it was stuck in the ice and didn't know how to get out. And we were able to see the light from the ship from the day-night band. Yeah, I'll show you some of that in here, too. Yeah, it's been a big hit. It's been uh, used for uh, monitoring lights and, and also economic development. You know, as cities grow, you can actually monitor the economic development. And so it's really, really good. <coughs> Uh, fishing vessels, you can monitor fishing, illegal fishing. You can monitor the, not so many lights in North Korea, <laughs> which is very interesting, uh, which is, uh, well, it's actually sad, right? And, and uh, what, what was that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I always, yeah, right, right. Their they're, 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 they're greenhouse gas footprint is small. Yeah, they're very progressive. Uh, so anyway. And then this is uh, beautiful imagery. So, uh, so again, um, even for broadcast meteorologists, you can show the animation of the geo, or you can just show a still of, of, this, um, of the blizzard. So very nice imagery. 
Now, I want to talk about co better coverage with two satellites. So now I have two satellites 15 minutes apart. So when you do things, this is actually an um, image of ocean color. So we also generate ocean color. This is chlorophyll. This is used for uh, ocean and coastal ecosystem work by our NOS, uh, National Oceanic Service, and National Marine Fishery Service. So we provide this product. And so, uh, so the blue here, blue area, so this is blue overlay, the product overlaid uh, true color imagery. And so this is basically chlorophyll. And you'll see a couple of things. Um, a lot of algorithms, um, even with aerosols, if you're looking at dust and air, air pollution, it has difficulty in sunglint areas. So this is here, you have sunglint, right? It's just too bright, you can't do a retrieval. Then, even though SWAT, I mean, even though Virus has this great SWAT of 3,000 kilometers, sometimes the algorithm has difficulty at the edge, at the furthest viewing geometry, because of atmospheric corrections that you have to make, especially in ocean color. So if I click next, so let, let's look at this area. So here, um, uh, here, okay, I'll put the cursor here. So here the algorithm cannot go out further than some angle. But then when we have NOAA 20, this is on Sumi NGP, we have NOAA 20, that covers that, that, that completes that. So this is going to be very important for compositing, so we get full global coverage. And then you can see with the sun glint here, you can see the sun glint area gets painted over by the data, mostly. There's still some outage, but it's pretty good. So that's why that's important. And, uh, and also for soundings, for Chris, for example, um, when you have two, um, and this is true for all the instruments. So this is Sumi MPP Chris. And so when you look at the edge of scan, the spatial resolution and spatial sampling of these observations, they degrade over, they degrade as you go out further. The pixels get larger. Now with VIRS, they only get uh, larger by a factor of two. But for soundings, they get huge. So, you know, instead of seeing a, let's say a 14 kilometer footprint at the edge, it grows to, um, you know, almost uh, like 35, 40. And, um, and so this is Chris from, one, from Sumi MPP. And then if you look at the edge, let's say Turkey here, t at the edge of Turkey, coastline Turkey, the next one you're looking straight down. So that's really important too. I know this is sort of getting into the weeds, but that's important because this shows the geometry. So you always strive for higher spatial resolution, higher detail. So we get the same detail in the vertical, but you also want to get in the horizontal. So you can see this is um, the footprint size um, from the middle straight down to as it scans out. So you can see how big that grows. But then Sumi, I mean, NOAA 20 will follow up by looking nearly straight down. So these footprints can be painted over by these smaller footprints. And here's another example of we use soundings so the CRIS and ATMS instrument data goes directly into NWP. The retrievals is used for now casting assessment. So this is basically tape being derived from retrievals, both from ATMS and CRIS together. And so you can see how dense these points are. So this is used by, um, or, uh, for severe weather uh, assessments, like convective initiation, so knowing if, a, if the situation is, uh, if the atmosphere is going to uh, have a lot of convective instability that will cause thunderstorms and severe weather. So this is a product that, that are, that's an AWIPS actually. And so you can see that as you go out further, you can see the spatial resolution degrades or, or the, and the spatial sampling, and then you get gaps. But when you get NOAA 20, it's gonna fill that in. It's gonna be sharp again. So that's gonna be very important and, and so forth. All right. Uh, this is an example of microwave rain rates, a little bit more eye candy, uh, but important though, right? These are quantitative measurements. So the microwave is really powerful. It gives you really good information, very accurate rain rates. And so this is Irma and Jose. And now this is again only from SUMI at PP. And, um, and then this is, we're starting to work in merging the geo with the, with the, uh, with the polar satellites. So here's a nice example of that. So this is ABI and lightning flashes superimposed the heavy precipitation. So, so you don't really know, I mean, you can, you can predict, but you don't really, you have the, so you see the clouds, you see the lightning flashes, but you really don't know the precipitation rate. 
And that's where microwave comes into. Now, we do have an infrared-based precipitation uh, product that, uh, from geostationary that is tied to the microwave. It's actually tuned to the microwave because infrared will, uh, infrared will basically associate cold cloud tops with heavy precipitation. It doesn't see inside. Microwave sees inside the storm, and so it gets temperature inside the storm and also rain rates inside the storm. So it's, it's different. So this is a nice example of using both. Okay, and here's more. Uh, now this is what a sequence of orbits look like from a polar satellite. This is from SUMI NPP, and this is a day-night band. Okay, so during the nighttime, um, infrared, ha I mean, during the nighttime, geostationary only has infrared, and sometimes it's hard to see the features. So if you look at an infrared um, during the night from ABI, of course you'll see the motion, right? It animates but you won't see the details like this. And so, so that's why it's complementary. Right. And of course, stunning images. This was on ABC uh, Nightly News and over Bar uh, Barbuda. And that, that's some incredible imagery. And this is the pending, uh, this is, well, this is Irma, not Maria, actually. This is Irma. And Puerto Rico when it had a lot of light. And, and now uh, I want to switch to now more using the data for uh, critical environmental intelligence. So this is power outages. This is before that static image at Puerto Rico, way before Maria. This is from July uh, 2017 and September 25th. So you can see that. And that product is actually, we uh, collaborated with FEMA, and FEMA has been using this product for uh, understanding or looking at the power recovery. So that's, that's really good. So Mitch, quick question for you. This is Dave Jones with Storm Center. With the, with the Night Lights uh, product for the, for the meteorologists that are here in the room and those that might be watching online, what's the scale of a power outage event that the satellite can pick up and is like worth doing a, a comparison? In other words, you know, if you, have, if you have a whole city out, that's one thing. If, it, if, if you have a line of storms coming through where it knocks power out, can you still see any sort of difference with the, with the Night Lights oh, product? No, absolutely. So this has a 750 meter resolution. So if you had a, a small town, it goes, the power goes out, you'll see it, you'll detect it. And so uh, that has great, uh, yeah, it can detect small lights. Remember I mentioned to you that light that was on that uh, crabbing vessel that got lost in the ice, it's just a regular ship light, and we were able to see it. And before, these are, now these are large lights, and, uh, in, um, in off of Korea, they have these squid boats, and, these, and they're really powerful spotlights, so it's very easy to detect those. But, yeah. but still, uh, one big spotlight is still a lot smaller than a little town of <laughs> lights, so you'll be able to see it. Okay, so uh, getting back to, uh, okay. yeah. Did they tell the to shoot the light up? Microsoft. Yeah. No, it's just Howard Bernstein, WSA. Did they tell the fishing folks shoot the light up for the satellite so we can track no, it? They actually wave. Uh, they try to catch a shadow. <laughs> no, 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 no. They don't. But if you communicated that, would it be easier? or Does it not matter because the satellite's that good? No, no. The lights are pointing down, and it's reflecting off the. You know, these lights. I'll have to show you a picture later. But these, there's a lot of lights around the boat, and also the spotlights. I watch deadliest down. catch. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're bright. They're bright, yes. but they don't point it up at the satellite because they're looking for the fish. And now, if there's flying fish, but I'm maybe. saying if they're stuck, it would be an easier way. Could perhaps. be for flying fish. Yeah. No. Oh, if they're stuck, no, no. I mean, if you're stuck, you just use regular communication, GPS, and and SARSAT and things like that. But if you're stuck in the ice, see, when that fish, that uh, vessel was stuck in the ice, it knew where it was. It just didn't know how to get out of the ice pack, and that's where. So we saw the light of the ship, but we also saw the ice pack, and so we were able to say, you know, you know. Say, you know, go straight, make a right, make a left, you're right out of the ice. I'm sure it was more sophisticated than that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now, I'm, so now I'm focusing on critical environmental intelligence, how the data can be used uh, from JPSS beyond weather forecasting. So as we know, the, uh, the Arctic ice is reducing over time, it seems to be, but it doesn't reduce, in a, it's not sequential, it, it sometimes is more ice one year than the next. So this is a good example of how we can use VIRS with high space resolution. Uh, this shows uh, that dark, it's basically, it's a, 
like a 10-day composite, so we're trying to get rid of the clouds, uh, which we do, do a pretty good job of getting rid of the clouds. So this shows the Northwest Passage here and in 2016. This is this cruise ship, you know, this uh, crystal, what is that, Serenity? Uh, yeah, that made two voyages, uh, both 2016 and 2017. So 2016, it had no problems because when you look at this, you can see that um, basically the ice, by the time it gets to this area, it's, it's the last day of August and you can see it clears out. Now, in 2017, totally different. I, actually, in the beginning of um, August, I was looking at this and I called the weather service. Are they asking for any guidance at all? I said, no, no, no. Because I don't think, I think they're going to have problems. <laughs> I'm just looking at this because you can get a tendency of, like it takes a while for ice to melt. So, and actually models. So this data in the future will go to models and the models will say, if I have this amount of ice, and we also have ice thickness. So we don't see, so our products include ice concentration, ice thickness. So you can imagine that if you have a certain amount of ice in the beginning of August or even the middle of August, you can say, well, how much ice will I have in two weeks from now? So you can do these forecasts. Well, it turns out if you look at the end of August, you still have ice. And looking at the ship logs, that yes, they needed help. They needed the Canadian Coast Guard to come out. So you can imagine um, over the next 20 years, more of this will be taking place where we're going to really have to survey the polar uh, region because there's going to be a lot of shipping. Now, the shipping, I think the shipping opportunity is really the month of August, uh, uh, but we'll see. You know, uh, But it's month of August is the, is the time when there's more shipping in the Arctic because of this. Now, of course, we, see, we can see ice through so many different ways. We use um, microwave. Microwave sees through clouds, right? I had to on the previous one. I had to take like a 10-day average. Well, actually, Andy Heininger had to take a day. At, he's from NOAA at University of Wisconsin. He had to take a 10-day average to screen out the clouds uh, because this is a, you know, it's basically a visible image, so you can get clouds. We also have microwave, which is really important. So microwave sees through clouds. And we also work with a Japanese sensor called AMSTER2, which is we actually process it within the JPSS program, which actually gives you higher space resolution ice. So this is ice cover, um, let's say maximum ice cover. I don't know if it's maximum, but it's March 15th, so that you can see the maximum. And then you can see the, um, you can see the minimum, September 15th. Then you can see the Northwest Passage having difficulty. This is ice concentration. And so, uh, so, so microwave is really important for seeing through clouds. Okay, our first major success working with, remember I talked about, you know, we're working with the user services and flood, flood mapping or flood watches or warnings is one of them. So this is from uh, Alaska um, uh, along the uh, Yukon River. And the city or the town of Galena had these massive, biggest flooding that they ever had. And it was all caused by an ice jam. And so we're able with Sumi and PP see the ice, ice um, jam because it has 375 meter resolution. So all this is where ice is located. And then we can also observe the flooding. So that's been a big hit. And that started with um, working with the guys up in Alaska and then we worked uh, with people from the river forecast centers within NOAA over the, over the continental US. And then it turned into, then we started working with FEMA. And so the next slide, will show what our product looks like. This is the end product that we generate from VIRS. And so it shows flooding. And, um, and FEMA really liked this product. And why did they like this product? Because first of all, um, VIRS has such a large uh, real estate, large swath. They get to see the area of flooding. And so then they can make um, decisions based on uh, population centers, um, you know, um, other reports. And then they can make a decision saying that, oh, look, there's a flood area here. This is located, let's say, with a population center that we're concerned about. There has been reports from this area. There's definitely flooding here. I can't see it at the street level, right? I can't see it. But what I'll do is I'll call an aircraft. I'll have aircraft data or drones flying over this area. If without this product, 
they would have difficulty knowing where to deploy their resources. So it's helpful. I mean, they've done it before, so this is the first time they're looking at this product. But he actually, the um, FEMA actually called me and said this is a big hit with them. So this is critical. And, and one thing about um, VIRS is that it has high spatial resolution. Another bad thing about VIRS is that, um, well, one bad, bad thing about VIRS is that it's, it's still pole of satellite, and it could be cloudy. So we were lucky it cleared up. Other days, we're not so lucky. And so this is why we use the geostationary. So we're using geo and polar together. Because you can imagine that the geostationary has this five minute temporal resolution. Five minutes. You can imagine a band of clouds with you know, slits of clear sky moving during the day. And then you can composite that, and you can basically the clouds disappear. So that's very powerful, too. And we've done this. Uh, for the first time, uh, integrating both SUMI and PBN GO 16. So this is, uh, I know for Florida, we would not have been able to generate this map uh, without using um, geostationary, because it was really cloudy. So this is a combination. And so it's, uh, it's a good example of merging both the geostationary and the polar satellite data. If you have a heavy rain event, you have flooding, and it clears out the next day, perfectly clear, you go to the VIRS because it has the higher spatial resolution. Uh, with the geostationary, you're more at a one kilometer resolution, and so you, you might not be able to see some details. And so, so it's a combination of the two. And we actually blend the two together. So when we blend it, if it's a mostly clear day, then 99% of the information really comes from the VIRS. And if it's a really cloudy day, then most of the information will come from the geostationary. Is Stephen able to use any of that? Yeah. Go back and describe models? And well, this is what we provide FEMA. So we were very excited about getting involved with FEMA. So when we showed Harvey, we showed, so I had some people I know at FEMA, so I sent this over. And they said, this is great. You have to participate in our remote sensing coordination calls. So we had these calls about uh, every day around 1 in the afternoon. And so we got really busy because, and then we would report, send out the products. There's this big server that people, and actually other agencies, other sa there's, there's SAR satellites that sees really high spatial resolution from other countries. They also contribute. So it goes into this big database. And, and so they were uh, very excited by this. So FEMA did use this for their assessments. Uh, what was another, uh, oh, another lesson learned. It was like, uh, FEMA had their phone calls one in the afternoon, but SUMI MPP doesn't pass over, and this is during daylight saving times, doesn't pass over until 2.30 in the afternoon. So I had to generate the geostationary image. <laughs> and then later on in the end of the day, I did the, I did the combination. Why don't you just talk to those four or something? They're busy, they have to make decisions. So, so they're, they're getting together at one o'clock in the afternoon in order to make decisions of where to have other assets taking a look at the flood. Four o'clock gets dark. They have to have daylight. You would do that, I know. <laughs> no. So anyway, it's a good example. So this was our first time we were able to really work with FEMA, and, and that's really satisfying. So we were able to take these basic measurements from our instrument and really turn it into a critical application. All right, and then, because Beers has this high spatial resolution, 375 meters, we can actually downscale it to 30 meters using digital elevation maps. And this is what Jacksonville looked like. And, um, and it actually validated very well. It, it looked really good. So this is the plane from Jacksonville. From Veers, downscale to 30 meter resolution. All right, other critical intelligence, fires. Did we have a lot of fires this year? Yep, lots of lots of fires. So, um, so our contribution to uh, forecasting was for the first time We've, uh, not first time, I, we did this two years ago, so it continued. Uh, we've improved, we use basically the fire locations from SUMI MPP uh, and the fire rated power, so we know how hot the temperature is, the fire is. And we put them into these smoke models, and these were a, a, a big hit. So of course, we worry about fires spreading, you know, you know, property, lives and property, things like that. But there's also another aspect of the fire, right? It's air quality. And Seattle, uh, actually my son moved to Seattle uh, in September, 
And he's saying, you know, I'm walking down the street and this ash is coming out of the skies. Does this always happen? I go, no, no, it doesn't happen. <laughs> but anyway, they were having a dreadful time there. And, and this is actually surface smoke from the HER model, the high resolution rapid refresh. And so this is one of these, um, remember I talked about the initiative, proving ground initiatives. We worked with, we had a meeting and we said, hey, we have five, various fire rated power. It could do a couple things. And Andy Edmond, who works as the SSD chief in the uh, Western region, he said, you know, we have a terrible time with forecasting smoke. Uh, would you like to help us? And I said, sure, absolutely. So uh, we went to the HER model because it has a three kilometer resolution. So it helps, uh, helps with the complex mountain terrain. And, it's, uh, and it has been a big hit. And so the, what this is showing, I'll show you in another slide, uh, next one is the smoke, 36 hour smoke forecast contracting over time. And so you want to know that, right? You want to know when the smoke will lift. So here's, again, the same thing. But on the left here is uh, the smoke and fire locations from Veers. So you can see how wide that smoke is. And these are the fire locations that's going to the model. And this is the forecast over there, 36-hour forecast, being generated using this as input. And so it shows that the smoke is contracting, and then this is the verifying image showing that there's less smoke. So that's been a big hit, uh, the smoke forecast. Do you have a question? I just got to point out, we have Dave's microphone. I just point out that uh, along the front range of Colorado, we had days where we couldn't see the mountains. Oh, yeah. There's so much smoke yeah. in here. And again, that's where uh, smoke from hundreds of miles away can impact people, you know, air quality. Yeah, I remember I had a, a colleague in uh, New Mexico saying the same thing uh, from, that, from this event. All right, and then also instead of just generating pretty images of the fire, we actually have quantitative um, products. So this is aerosol optical thickness. It basically shows how thick the smoke is, and that's also used in models to do forecasting smoke. And we also remember earlier I said, uh, Chris also does a lot more than temperature and water vapor, does CO. And this is a uh, retrieval at these different points. So this is each location in this area. And then you can click on this and look at a profile of what CO looks like as a function of height. And you can see that the major concentration of CO is indeed in the, in the lower levels. All right. uh, new capabilities of fire detection is that um, you know, we have that day-night band, so we can see small fires. So, like I said earlier, we want to be able to see small fires before they start. We also want to be able to see fires as they grow. So that's why geo and pole is really important. It's not one or the other. Every situation will call for different resources. And it turns out that out of all the satellites in the world, even though the geostationary has a five-minute refresh, 15-minute refresh, we see sm more fires, 50% of all fires is actually detected by, uh, and this is, was actually, the study was done over Brazil, so it wasn't global, so I, I'm not using that as an advantage. The Brazilians did a study that showed 50% of all fires was detected by Sumian PP, because it's detecting these small pesky fires. <laughs> so for example, if this, uh, I guess so, if this room was on fire, a blaze, you would be able to see that from a satellite. Uh, probably even half the room, I think it's, uh, like a 10 feet by 10 feet area. Even though the pixel is 375 meters, uh, 10 by 10 has so much radiant energy coming out of it, we can see it. So this is now using the day-night band. So, so in this image, we see, um, we see these small little points here. This is a thermal IR image. So you can see thermal signatures, which is normally used, right? This is lights, the light of the fire. So you can see a lot more of them. And, and then I always have to compare this with a static image of the lights. You know, what does lights look like when there's not a fire? And this is this one. So you can see the difference. Every, all the lights that you see, all these extra lights are from fires. So that's gonna be, a lot more work has to be done in order to put this in an application, right? We'll have to come up with algorithms and things like that. Uh, yes, Joe? Yeah, most of the time we're talking about things that we watch after the fact. Are there people looking and spotting the, and finding these things ahead of the time? Yeah, or yeah. Are you? Really? Yeah. I mean, there's guys who are just looking all the time? Yeah, or? yeah. 
Wow. They look for small fires. And then when you, so, so I always think. Howard Burns, WUSA, are there, are there people, are there algorithms or computers just looking at this stuff and then yeah, yeah. senses uh -huh. something and, and lets you know? Yep. So, so there doesn't have to be somebody staring at a monitor 24 seven? Right, right, right. And I'll show an example of volcanic ash monitoring on that. Okay. But yeah, but this is new, so we haven't done anything with this. So when you have a small fire, you have to ask the question, hey, I have a small fire. And let's say the forecast was rain for the next day. I don't have to do anything about it. If I have a small fire, oh, small fire, uh, it's, it's 10 miles away from a town. It's going to continue being dry. It's going to be windy. I'm going to take notice. I want to do something, right? So that's why it's important to detect small fires before they become large fires. It's also important to, um, to look at um, these fires in real time. Do you have a question? I have until 10 o'clock, so I don't have many slides left. All right. All right, all right. So anyway, that's exciting. Now, notice that it was... I love Veers. Veers is like, I'm really getting to Veers now because it's like for land remote sensing and also, well, land ecosystems as well as um, ocean ecosystems. So this is a picture of vegetation from December 2016 versus December 2017. You see how different those two images are? We had more fires in 2017. But it was also uh, a lot drier. Look how dry that is, dry to the bone. So that's, that's amazing. So we'll have to use more of this data to do more assessments. This is a nice image showing burn scars. Um, this is June 2014 versus 2017. Suddenly you'll see a burn scar in here, over there. So you can see a couple things, June, June 2014. Uh, this fire was in September 2014, by the way. It was much drier. Uh, you can see in, in June 2017, there was a lot more snow on the mountaintops. Uh, there's other things you can see. There's more water in these lakes, uh, reservoirs. Um, so you can actually look at burn scars. And since we have this long record of this, right, it's just now, so a couple of things. I always say, well, someone told me this. Uh, um, at AMS, uh, this person gave a good presentation. And what we really want to know, three things, right? And I, I put that in my summary, too. What has happened, what is happening, and what will happen? And so the important ingredient for this is what has happened. This is there was a fire, and there was a burn scar. Well, will this burn scar impact anything with erosion, rain? You, well, you heard about the Santa Barbara, right? So um, that's terrible. So we have to keep an eye on that. And then by having a lot of data, over the time, this is October 2014. This is a month right after the uh, fire. And you can see that there's still probably, uh, you know, leaves, burn, burnt leaves on top of the trees, probably. And then eventually they fall off. This is one year later. And then you can see, you can monitor the recovery. And so let me flip back to this one. So, yeah, so you can see in this area, you can see the burn scar is starting to recover. And so this data, because we're now uh, pretty good resolution, 375 meter resolution, global, we're going to have these observations for the next 20 years. We're going to be able to do a lot of good assessments with this. All right. And uh, this is a famous product that we have at NESDIS that uh, looks at the health of vegetation globally and um, against a 20, 30 year, 35 year climatology actually. This is from AVHR. And we're now continuing this with VIRS. And so this is really important for food security. So you can assess like which areas are prone to droughts and things like that. And even in African countries, when you have favorable, favorable vegetation, which is shown in blue, you can have risk of malaria. When it's really dry, risk of fires. And actually our biggest customer is the um, USDA. They use this product monthly as one of their products. <laughs> Not, you know, they don't base their decisions just on when this product in order to come up with agriculture productivity assessments. Uh, critical environmental intelligence over for fisheries. So uh, this is ocean color. This is chlorophyll over, uh, around the Gulf of Mexico. And so people are doing studies. Like, for example, in this study here um, in the upper, they're looking at the, and trying to forecast how, you know, the amount of salmon returns up the, you know, through the Columbia River. And so they forecasted back in 2011 a pretty good return, but the observed return was much lower than expected. 
And they basically tracked this to a very low level of chlorophyll in the Gulf of Alaska. So you can see the connections there, the food, the food sources with the migration. And so people will start using this data more and more for these type of studies. Um, okay, I'm wrapping up. Okay, this is not a nice, nice cool imagery. This is before and after Irma. So after you get a hurricane, you get a lot of turbidity in the ocean waters because, you know, especially on the western part of, uh, of Florida because the, it's the, of the shelf. I mean, it's a lot, lot shallower. And you get sediment runs off from the land too. So this is before and this is after. So this is really cool, right? And this is uh, Key West. This is before and this is after. So this is basically the best resolution I can get out of beers. Um, and so this is before and after. So that's really cool. I talked about illegal fish. There are a lot of illegal fishing, so the data has been used to monitor fishing uh, regulation. Uh, air quality. So I didn't talk about OMPS at all. Um, and people from the OMPS team, they always say, why don't you talk more about OMPS? And I have to. But uh, OMPS uh, also generates not just ozone. It, it, uh, it generates an aerosol product, and it handles it through clouds pretty well. So this is an example of heavy dust in China. This is what it looks like at the ground. This is what it looks like from space. And so hopefully, as air gets cleaner over time, we're all hoping that takes place in the next 20 years, we'll have the satellite also for the next 20 years monitoring um, improved air quality. Um, this was how, Howard, you talked about hey, I need to automate this. And so University of Wisconsin um, has this VOLCAD. It's called the Volcanic Cloud Alert Automatic Detection. And it's looking for signatures. And so last week, it was able to detect a very small volcano ash using SUMI MPP. The geostationary did not pick that up until much later because the geostationary has like a, I forgot, either one or two kilometer footprint this is 375 meter resolution. So it was able to detect that. Now, once it detected that and says, oh, there's definitely a signature there, then I watch it with a geostationary satellite because I know it's there. So it, again, it's a combination of the, of the measurements. Um, spatial, temporal, all comes into play. And so to summarize, uh, with the launch of JPSS-1, which is now No. 20, and GOES-R, which is now GOES-16, and soon we'll have GOES-S, which will hopefully become GOES-17, we now have the most advanced weather satellites to provide the nation with the criti and critical intelligence needed to feed weather forecast models and also to provide this critical environmental intelligence, you know, where the lights are out, where the flooding is occurring. And so we'll be able to answer the basic questions, you know, we all ask or, you know, a common, what has happened? So what has happened? So you look at a flood, after heavy rain, what has happened? How large is this flood event? Or how has um, sea ice changed over the past 20 years? We'll have those long time series. What is happening? That's where the geostationary is taking place. What is happening in real time? And the power of the J uh, polar satellites is really what will happen? What, what will the forecast be five days from now? So it all comes together uh, with NOAA 20 and GOES 16. So thank you. Mitch, thank you very much. It's terrific. We have some time for uh, questions. We have until uh, 10 o'clock or so. And just to let everybody in the room know, uh, we have uh, folks, uh, a lot of them, that are watching online. So if you do have a question, please introduce yourself and uh, start the discussion going. And we'll keep going until about 10 o'clock. I have the other microphone. I can hand to anybody else. Just raise up your hand so I know who to hand it to. Howard? Uh, Howard Bernstein, WSA. Mitch, I'm overwhelmed with the amount of products and data. I mean, is there a room somewhere where you guys are just trying to figure out new things to do? I mean, it's job security uh, amazing for, with, all, with all that's being detected and, and the possibilities ahead. Yeah, well, you know, at NOAA, we're, we're lucky. I, I'm lucky to work at NOAA because we have NOAA services. So remember that chart I showed earlier? Um, I'll go back to it really quickly. Uh, but NOAA has so many services that we depend on. And, and these services is from blizzard warnings to hurricane warnings to... Uh, um, here, here they are. And so we have all these services. So what we're trying to do with the NOAA is to improve these services. So we have these workshops, and we say this is what we can do, but we really have to understand what you need. And so we have these great initiatives where we work together to improve these um, applications. So it's very exciting because 
if I was at a different agency, it's easy to work within my agency because we're generating these operational products on these operational machines that are feeding into operational services. And underlying these operational machines and operational services is exploratory activities, which we work with, on with the research community or the operational community. So it all comes together. Because again, at the end of the day, um, those flood maps is a great example. We could have been just draining flood maps and putting it on a website and a lot of eye candy. But instead of that, we worked with the Weather Service River Forecast Center. And we got it into AWIPS. And that's the system that they use. And they use it all the time now. And so, so it's important to get in services. So job security, it's not really, we don't care so much about job security. We care about relevancy. We are, this is a very relevant mission we have. Uh, and NOAA is right at the, at the front, front line in doing this. And it's all free. It's all free, free and well, it's the, the US taxpayers. It's a, it's a great investment, right? You can see, well, well, look at the forecast. I mean, the forecast, it's making your job easier too, right? You got a reliable forecast uh, with uh, satellites and weather forecast models underpinning all this. And also from the private sector, they're doing also forecasting. So it's, it comes together. It's observations of computers, the analysis, the smart forecasters, everything. Smart country, right? A smart country <laughs> a smart should country. invest in its uh, in its services to protect its citizens and property. Mitch, I wanted to mention also in the audience uh, we have with us here, uh, those of you in the room, you can look over. Here is uh, Heath Hockenberry, who's going to speak on Thursday uh, about uh, fire weather prediction and the monitoring that they're doing. So, Joe, I know that you brought up the question: Is there really somebody looking at this? So, Heath, I thought maybe you could just say a couple of sentences um, about you know how you use satellite imagery and then. You know, we'll certainly get a much more detailed presentation on Thursday. I can steal my own thunder here. So, um, yeah, uh, do we have people looking at this 24-7? We, we do. We do our best. We've had cases where we detect fire, we get a request for a forecast from a particular spot, and that location is wrong. Uh, we actually issue forecasts f for those fire detections. Um, and... The three things that I heard are fire detections, smoke, and after effects. So you could probably all imagine the, the flood gates opening with this new technology in fire weather. Mm -hmm. From real-time fire weather forecasts to monitoring how, f how a hot the fire is burning. And again, fires blow up within 20 minutes sometimes. That's so right. Uh, the now casting capability is just going to be huge. But yeah, we're, we're looking at this stuff and we issue about 25,000 spot forecasts a year. Right. Um, not all for these quick detects. Most of them are for prescribed fire. But we have a significant chunk, about 30% that, that are for wildfire. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heath. That's terrific. Anybody else in the room here have any questions for uh, Mitch? Um, okay. Just over here. Uh, Mitch, uh, Todd Santos, uh, News 4 Buffalo. Curious, you know, last year you had asked all of us, uh, you know, operational forecasters, meteorologists, what would we want of all these products that you're giving? We all said everything. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> it seemed kind of crazy because there's so much resolution and it's global and all this. Uh, has there been more talk over the last year to try to make some more of this available? I know with uh, Storm Center Communications and GeoCollaborate, there have been some things that have, have been available. And I think a lot of us have utilized that through hurricane season and beyond. Um, I mean, we care so much about these little slices about our own areas that we each have to watch. Um, I mean, from the ice jam detection to a lot of these other things, even yeah. the fire detection, how much more of this is going to be coming online for all of us to use operationally? I think we've made some progress. Remember, uh, the, I think the big services don't provide polar satellite data. And so, so Dave's been doing a good job getting some of the data out to you. Uh, I've seen reports by Jennifer um, on the power outage, really good with the slider. <laughs> that was great. And also the, um, the fire. And so, um, so we've been, so last year we said that, hey, let's try to get more uh, polar satellite data out there for these special events. You know, the Hurricane Irma event was on ABC uh, News. And uh, so, I th and we also have a good comms department with the NOAA. And so, uh, we've been getting these uh, ev you know, data out. So, so um, polar satellite data is really good for these special events, you know, these um, extreme events. 
like the flood maps and things like that. But you just need more time in your broadcast. So for example, <laughs> if you're talking about Hurricane um, Harvey, right, are you going to be able to show a flood map? Right? Are you going to have time to show a flood map? So, but, um, but I think by us communicating, I think you know what's available. So you should have in your mind saying that, wait a minute, like, I, I wonder if, if Polar satellites, if JPSS can provide something, or even Gozar, if that's something unique. And, uh, and then just contact us, or contact Dave, <laughs> and uh, Dave can uh, get you the right information. Or, or look at NOAA, uh, social, NOAA media. You know, we put a lot of, every, anytime there's an event, even the flood maps, the next day they were on um, our um, NOAA, uh, at NOAA satellites, you know, Twitter feed and all that. Yeah, John Leslie does all that. So, so anytime I think I, when I think there's something special to be shown, and also other researchers, they contact, they give it to John Leslie, and John Leslie will post it. So you just have to keep an outlook for these these events. And you know the comment that you made that Mitch made to everybody, you know, you, you need more time in your weathercast, right? I mean that's the that's the uh, the ultimate fight. You need more time. But if you find out about new and unique type of imagery that you want to put on the air. Uh, that unique imagery is what distinguishes you from anybody else uh, in your market. And so the more you can show that kind of satellite imagery on the air and explain with some subject matter expertise, you know, whether you send an email to Mitch and say, hey, Mitch, I'm thinking about using this, uh, you know, what does it mean? Um, I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, that'll probably garner some more time for you on the air because you can tell your management that you're probably the only one that has it in your market because you're taking the steps to, yeah. to get that information. Yeah, and that's a good point, so, Howard. You mentioned John Leslie. That's a great outlet. So I don't know if you subscribe to at NOAA satellites, but you should. I mean, that really, if you want access to even that slider of the uh, Puerto Rico uh, lights out on off, that's on our um, on at NOAA satellites. So if you don't subscribe to that, I think it, it would be worthwhile doing so. That sounds great. Another round of applause for Mitch. Thank, uh, you, thank you very much. Thank you, Mitch. Dave. I really Thanks appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks.